All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar. Uh, good afternoon to all of you who are joining us, uh, and thank you for joining us for the 10 Best Practices for Integrating Your Customer Data webinar. Uh, just to answer some questions that are already coming up, we will be sending out a recorded version of this webinar after the fact, and we will also be sending the slide deck to everyone. Today I am joined by Paul Varley uh, and Pierre Hulsebus. Just a few housekeeping items. The phone lines are muted. Uh, the presentation will definitely be approximately 60 minutes. Uh, we have not too much time left at the end for questions, uh, but we will certainly do our best to address the questions at the end of the presentation or by email follow-up afterwards. Uh, so just a quick agenda for the day. Uh, we're going to do some introductions of our speakers and uh, then we will be talking about the 10 best practices for integration. So some quick introductions of our presenters. We have Paul Varley. He is our Director of Product Management. Uh, as Director of Product Management, Paul Varley orchestrates the product planning, development, and release processes here at Scribe. And then Pierre Hulsebus. He is our Senior Sales Engineer. And as our Senior Sales Engineer, he uh, has duties that take him all over the world, meeting with different organizations to really help them understand how to integrate complex customer data. Pierre has over 24 years of experience in IT sales and marketing. Uh, he's a nationally recognized expert in dynamic CRM and complex data migration and integration projects. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Paul Barley. Here we go. Okay, thank you, Scott. How are you doing today, Pierre? Super, super, good, Paul. Good talking to you today. Let's jump yeah. in and start talking about the um, the uh, things you want to think about when you start an integration project. And so let's start it out uh, just talking about what integration means. Integration is really a broad term. It can mean a lot of different things to different people. So is it safe to assume that your customer or your stakeholders really understand what integration is when you start a project? <laughs> well, we all know what they say about when you assume, so it's probably right. not safe to, safe to assume anything. But, uh, but yeah, one of, the, one of the big kind of problems or challenges right up front with integration is that, uh, you know, we often lack in business planning and business process integration uh, that common lexicon. Right, so uh, my best example always is um, if we talk to somebody in CRM about what an account means, that usually means a customer record. That's kind of what they call it over in the CRM system. But then we get into an integration discussion talking with somebody from the finance department, and when they talk about accounts, they are thinking about like chart of accounts. And so you be having this kind of conversation for five minutes, and and people kind of have that quizzical look because. We're lacking sometimes that common understanding. And so, you know, when we think about integration and kind of step back, we really have to understand what one person might call integration for a certain object might be totally different what, than what other folks are thinking about. Uh, process uh, projects like these, uh, when we're talking about integration, it could be really migration, like we're uh, integrating the data through a migration of a project or something on that order. Um, things also could be like accessing the data. They could be thinking about that where really we're integrating um, an access to the data like through an iframe or through a web kind of call out to the data in order to present it and that really isn't replicating the data back and forth it's just kind of but it integrates the data for the user. So you know everybody kind of has to it's good important thing right up front to always establish this. Uh, this also could be um, business process integration, and we'll we'll talk about some of these other things later on too. But uh, really, more business process integration for some folks, uh, putting your phone system and having a, a screen pop, you know, that's integration uh, for some folks because it has to reach out. The phone system has to reach out and talk to an ERP system or something like that to get the customer, you know, phone number. So that's integration also. So it's really really important when we you know, start on the road of these conversations to kind of build that that lexicon of, of of what we're really talking about. Are we really trying to have this? What we're really trying to do is kind of have this common definition and understanding 
uh, for everybody of what the integration process will do as an end goal. So something, for example, might be we're going to automate a business process. We're going to provide missing information uh, during a phone conversation for our customer care people, or we're going to eliminate uh, manual data entry. And uh, you know, understand that a lot of these, you know, all the cards get um, put on the table. You know, all everything is there uh, for us in these planning process to kind of understand what that business process is and what we're really trying to integrate. So, yeah. So clearly, it's very important to start out with a common understanding of what you mean when you talk about integration. Um, the next thing you, we we wanted to talk about um, is when. We often talk about how the integration benefits the business, but many times it's in very vague terms. How do you implement an integration project that's going to be successful and really demonstrates value to the business? Yeah, uh, you know, one of my examples for this is really a personal example. I have two two sons, uh, and when uh, my oldest son was 10 years old, he loved two things. One, cars and uh, University of Michigan. Right, so uh, those two things he really liked, and so um, we got a, like a '57 Chevy little model car, and he built it and he painted it maroon and gold, which is the school colors, and that was he was excited about that. But when um, his mom saw it, the box had that '57 Chevy kind of all painted like a production '57 Chevy, black and white, and was all chromed out. And uh, so she was like, well, when are you guys going to paint it? And we're like, well, no, it's done. Right? So it's really interesting that, you know, to him, success was getting it to look like two cool things that he loved. And to her, success was, you know, painting it just like the model on the cover. That would have been successful. So it's important <laughs> as a group that we would have had a common understanding of what success was. And uh, so that's really what we're talking about is defining what, is going to be successful. What is the outcome that is going to be happening on the other end of this this journey that we're going to have? So we to get there, you know, we want it to be measurable. We want it to be something that we can um, have these kind of goals. Uh, they may be modest uh, at first. Um, that first part of the process is kind of thinking big, and this is kind of getting much more down to the specifics. And uh, it is a bit of a spectrum. Uh, and the way I see, what I mean by that is that ROI and measurable outcomes for all the different types of people that are on the phone today listening to this call. We have some some organizations that are you know 100 people or or less, right? And they don't have a very complex business planning process. They're not ISO 9000. They don't have all of the kind of ROI measurements that a a manufacturer that has, you know, half, you know, five hundred million dollar manufacturer is going to be ISO nine thousand. They might have very specific outcomes that they're looking for with very specific ROI goals. So somebody like that, they're going to be looking at, hey, we're going to reduce the uh, the qu quantity of of reentry. Uh, uh, we're going to re improve our or reduce our returns by four percent. We're going to improve our um, our uh, customer satisfaction by an X amount, and they can actually tie that out to dollars and cents uh, because they, they usually have people that actually just measure this type of stuff in order to maintain compliance with their you know, ISO 9000 or Six Sigma kind of processes. Other organizations might, uh, you know, that's way too much, right? They're, they're much more like we, we bought a marketing automation system. We're into now using a Marketo, let's say, or some, some cool marketing automation tool. And they made a big investment over there. And now they just want to say success, to, success for us is just integrating that and, and integrating that to the point where we, um, you know, we reduce the manual entry of leads into our CRM system by you know 50 percent and so those would be kind of things but we're looking for kind of some very specific things that say up front we can where this is what our goal is and then when we're done at the end and you'll see when we kind of get to the end of these we loop back to those and say did we meet these objectives and you know what did we what did we learn from that that part of the process so so i would say quantitative outcomes what is the roi and uh for, for this project, what's the ROI? And, and as I mentioned, some of it can be very specific. 
and uh, some of the larger you know organizations and some of the specific organizations where you have that specific outcome that ROI pays for the project you know you can measure that and say we're going to reduce the FTEs by you know 35 percent for order entry and because the salespeople are going to do the quoting now and then we're going to integrate the orders directly in so we don't have to redo the orders and so because of that you know customers are saving dollars real dollars and cents uh, because they can either repurpose those individuals or they can um, they have this money back now then this this productivity back in their organization they can reduce the cost of managing the orders so you know they're saving five cents an order or they're you know uh, they're uh, reducing the FTE count for um, the sales support group by X amount of, of people so yeah and that's a great lead into the next topic which of course is the budget. Now that you've agreed on a business problem and a plan for what you're going to integrate, what other considerations should you be aware of when you start an integration project? Well, so uh, yeah, commitment is probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, one of the questions uh, when I was doing uh, more of the consulting work and worked on project work, uh, you know, it, it is really what have we done in the past and why, how much did it cost and how, why didn't it work? Right, so you're asking these kind of questions in order to get to this real budget. So, a budget isn't just the money, you know, isn't just the dollars in terms of uh, something that you would write a check and send a purchase order for, whether that's consulting hours or you know uh, FTE budgets between departments or software and the technology that needs to support integration. But the real impact and the real budget has a lot to do with the research uh, and learning curve that comes with. Uh, doing a project maybe even the first time making sure you understand all the costs so sometimes things like uh, when we talk we're going to talk a little about the API economy and what that really means uh, but the impact of that is sometimes there's costs associated like uh, with uh, being on certain levels of the APIs um, there's extra licenses maybe for the different systems that we're working with because we're integration um, integrating with another system that might mean we have to log in as a user which consumes a license so that might be another cost that is uh, impacting our, our overall budget um, a uh, the other one that I think about is uh, the time uh, impact uh, one of the things that integration uh, brings up is often business process issues uh, because really we're it's not only the data that we're moving but people have to behave a little differently like in my scenario of a, a sales order entry you know we have people that are re-entering sales orders and because of that maybe an integration project wants to remove that process well now other processes got get impacted by that like where's the approval process uh, for those quotes you know the sales engineers may need to do something differently now than they were doing before so there's a, more of the personnel and time impact that can happen on these projects. And the more subject matter experts that we get involved with those kind of business process stuff, what happens is, you know, the people have regular day jobs. They still need to do their regular jobs typically. And uh, so uh, there's an impact in terms of productivity sometimes that can happen uh, with, with folks. We need to be able to dedicate resources often from the business side of, a, of an organization that are out there doing order fulfillment or order processing or or you know uh, other things in their job that we're trying to automate now I, I'm taking away from their regular job so there's impacts there too so this kind of downtime I also consider I think it's important to consider in this budget what we would refer to as first-time expenses. So things that you know you just do once. So does your organization really need to uh, learn all about how to install something or even architect something that they're only going to do once? Uh, sometimes we can in, we might have to pay uh, uh, consultants or partners out there that are subject matter experts in those types of things to come in and do it because they can get it done in a week where our people would have to learn the tool and go through training and what someone could have done in a week now a month later we're just now getting our arms around so it's kind of that uh, so when we talk about budget we we really mean real budget because those are typically the things that uh, come up later on when things go sideways or when things are problematic it's not because it we didn't have the money for the software it's much more about the people weren't aligned we didn't have all the right assets on the task to do it or you know other business processes uh, 
took our people away from us, and so now it's taking longer to get things done. Sure. So we hear a lot about the API economy today, and it seems like a lot of vendors are talking about interoperability and integration via APIs or other tools. What do you need to know about your systems before you start integrating? You know, so <laughs> the promise of the API is often not the reality of the APIs. So, uh, you know, just quite frankly, some APIs are just awful, right? They're just bad. Uh, and yeah, we've run across a few of them. And uh, yeah, we have. And a lot of that is it's not so much that the the people that were, that are writing the APIs were were bad be dummies or something like that. They didn't know what they were doing. It's often because the APIs initially are purpose written. Right, they're written for a specific use case, and they fixed that. You know, just like any other IT project, they had a very specific use case. And now we might be coming at this application from a different angle, or um, the system is very mature and the API is old. Uh, a good example, not to pick on anybody on this, but I think of one that we work with often is SharePoint. Uh, SharePoint is a has been around for a long time, and they've had an API for a long time to work with. And so that web service, now today, SharePoint is used in so many different ways than it was initially you know, conceptualized for. And so it's much more complicated now because there's so many more use, you know, there's the kind of maintain legacy compatibility with the new versions. And uh, so people don't have to rewrite the code. So you kind of had this legacy effect where it's like if you went back to the drawing board and started all over, you would kind of do it a totally different way. And so knowing the systems and the APIs, and again, this, some of this gets down into that one-time skill. I may have folks available to me that already know, the, have worked with the APIs that are maybe solution architects in these particular applications. And so they know kind of the tricks and, and the shortcuts, if you will, on that roadmap through an API. But, you know, we also want to step back and think about things like, as I mentioned earlier, some of the APIs have vendor limitations and rules for the data. They um, have storage fees. There's throttling that you would never see when you're doing testing. Uh, but as soon as you get into a production environment and putting real data, now all of a sudden the API behaves totally different. Um, again, licensing uh, often comes up. So it's like, yeah, uh, a developer read a blog or went to a trade show and said, hey, we can integrate with this really cool tool. And uh, so then they go down the road, let's get an integration tool and platform and do it. And then they start, they, th that salesperson or that uh, developer may not have known that, oh, yeah, well, that that's only available if you have a certain login or if you have this particular, if you're on this particular platform. So the API documentation is pretty easy to find typically, but it's not typically associated with what's the impact of, of running an API connection. So, uh, you know, what your, what your vendor gives you access to and um, all those different methods that you can use, you know, might be impacted totally differently from, uh, from what's on the piece of paper to what the reality is. So. Sure, yeah, it doesn't always do everything that you yeah. <laughs> might expect it to. Yeah. And as you said, different APIs can be very different in terms of the functionality that they provide. Yeah, from a deliverable on this, you know, it's really looking at what are all the systems. Uh, this is, you know, this isn't a small order. This is really before you buy anything, before you make a big commitment, you really need to have an understanding of all these systems, the metadata layers, how the workflows impact one another, and the cascading effects of integrations and what the limitations are that that API has. Right. So once we understand our systems, can we just um, pick an integration platform and get started, or is there any other preparation we need to do before we sit down to the keyboard? So, uh, you know, we definitely want to uh, have an understanding of what we're going to be integrating. You know, so we we talk about, uh, you know, integrate, uh, map twice, integrate once. We want to put this all on paper uh, and a lot of times this is this part here of this process is one area some some projects can be iterative or kind of agile in terms of we learn as we go and and in this world often it's not that way at all in this world we often want to say this is specifically the process that we're going to map and we need to sit down with the the users and the stakeholders 
and walk through that process and we need to um, get screenshots and we need to go through that and really fill that use case out before and we want to do all of these mappings on paper so it's kind of uh, deliverables from this is typically a Visio uh, documents that outline each of the use cases Excel documents that get down to the field level mappings and understanding the data type differences often between there uh, and uh, mapping this all out before we uh, we actually you know uh, open up any code or buy any tool because often this uh, will uncover other issues right this is the part of the process where um, a great example would be you know saying hey we need to get our quoting in our CRM system and so uh, what we need are two things we need a quoting tool uh, for for our CRM system and then we need a uh, we need to integrate uh, the the CRM tool with uh, you know our ERP system so that you know the data is in CRM and and uh, so all the products are in there and then you know you kind of someone's going to push the button when they're done and the the quote will just get sent over as an order to the ERP system and it's just going to be awesome when we do that and so the IT department goes through this process and kind of looks at the databases and they go yeah this maps to here and this is how we get the products over and then um, then they deploy it and then nobody uses it <laughs> they get really upset with that and what they forgot to do is sit with that end user and watch what a salesperson has to go through to fill a quote out so they're doing something in Excel maybe now and again now the, the IT department says we can we're gonna make this happen all in CRM but during the quoting process you see that the, the salesperson they have to pick the phone up and they pick the phone up to talk to you know a product manager and ask them about some specifications of the product they have to send an email over to somebody in um, procurement to find out when a product is going to be available they uh, might have to call the manufacturer uh, if they're a distributor to get um, um, PDF files or cut sheets that go along with uh, that quote when they deliver it out to a customer uh, they see the printout that the cust that the salesperson has to go through to put the company logo on and to customize the deliverable to the customer and the cover letter that they have to do. So it's not just <laughs> moving some fields between two systems. It's a process that that salesperson goes to. And so if I'm just the IT department saying, hey, we just integrated your quotes, it's like you saved me nothing. You made it actually more complicated because now what I used to do now I have to fill out your stupid form, right, <laughs> to get this in. And it just takes longer, right, because I've got my process down. And so this is the thing, is that it's not often just sitting and going uh, through the field level mappings in the database management part. It's sitting with those end users and going, what is involved in that business process? And trying to find out where the real value in deliverable it may be more valuable just to show inventory quantities and give me all the product information that might be the best uh, phase one of an integration job for automating somebody's <laughs> quoting system is just to get the product information in and that would save them emails and phone calls mm. and, and uh, that part of the process right so just you know having don't boiling the ocean is one that uh, that we like to use you know that it's not such a huge project that we're going to do everything now and it's going to take a long time to do it it's you know we're going to we're going to we have a we'd love to get to this fully integrated piece but you know the most productive thing that we can do right now for giving a customer care person you know kind of order status is you know, just giving them order status, maybe not all the details of the line items on the order and the tracking numbers. You know, it just depends on what's going on. But I think our, our point here in this one is your integration designs, you know, really need to be helpful for picking the appropriate approach and the platforms that you're going to use. So for some things it might be, and we'll talk a little bit about this, um, but when we're working through uh, some of the data challenges or some of the data options that you have with integration, one of the things we distinguish or Scribe makes a difference between is you have tools that do data replication that copy data from one system to another system, right? So providing that inventory quantity right there on the screen for somebody to see. Another thing might be more event-driven that says uh, when I click that product, what I want to do is in the background have a, 
uh, query go and grab the uh, inventory quantity of all the warehouses of what's on hand right now. And I, I just need to display that maybe in an iframe or some other way to a grid to a user. So I don't need to replicate that data. I just need to integrate the data. So there is a bit of a nuance in, in English here between replication and integration. So sometimes we can integrate the data without using all of the kind of database management tools that might just be a query, you know, or a fetching of an iframe kind of information on a web form that gives us that information or a report that they print out that goes and, you know, runs a kind of a SQL query or a query kind of report that says, okay, here's the inventory status and shows it on their screen. So uh, it's not always, you know, the tool. So that's why having this integration mapped out on paper and having a, an awesome understanding of that and an agreement uh, by, you know, the, the key stakeholders here of this is what we're actually going to do is uh, going to save everybody all the headache later on uh, because often we're finding things going sideways when this process wasn't done. And IT today, and I'm, I know I'm going on a little on this because this is, I'm pretty passionate about this, this one topic here because this, this hangs us up a lot um, with, with different projects because this gets skipped. Um, this, there is a contention today, or let's say attention would be a better way to say it, maybe attention uh, in modern application design around agile versus waterfall process. And for folks that are not IT, the, the, the distinction would be a much more, let's say, traditional way of, of develop and design and deploy kind of model. And then what's referred to as an agile model, which kind of it's, um, you kind of discover changes as you go along. So you kind of get some momentum in your project going and then you do, do workshops and you discover this information and then you go develop for that and then you go back and discover more information and develop to that and then you kind of roll out changes as you go. So today what you see is kind of a hybrid model where people are doing planning and kind of learning as you go. And this is one area where planning is more important than learning <laughs> as you go or at least putting this into be one sprint cycle. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do inventory quantities. That's going to be one sprint cycle. I'm going to learn stuff later on about other things, but that's going to be the scope of our project that we're going to do. So you can, people have a hybrid, or organizations often have a hybrid of this, but the important thing here is that you have this a, a thorough understanding of a very specific business process that you're going to, to work on. And an agreement to what what we're going to do to you know uplift that process or make it better. Great. Well, that's how, that's the first five, and we're going to take a short break here. Yeah. So thanks, Paul. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch a quick poll. Scribe is going to be launching a new webinar series based on this series, and we'd really like to get some feedback from you guys of uh, what topics you would like to see. So of the first five topics that we just shared. Uh, can you let us know which one or ones you are interested in seeing a deeper webinar on? Just a little interactive piece halfway through here for those of you on the webinar. And we see a lot of you guys voting. This is great. Thank you. Great, I'll go ahead and give it another five or so seconds. Seems to be a clear winner appearing here as well. Great, yeah. Uh, so it looks like our, our, uh, our winner here is definitely the, the mapping out the integrations uh, conversation we were just having with Pierre. Yeah, so good thing that that's an important topic yeah, to you, Pierre. You'll have, uh, looks like you may have another opportunity to address that question <laughs> again in the near future. That's but good. Uh, from that point, let's uh, let's keep moving on. We want sure. to try to cover all of this in the in the hour that we've allotted. So, um, next next thing we wanted to talk about is really where have you seen integration projects fail in the past? So, <laughs> where have you seen them fail? I've I've seen them fail in the north and in the south <laughs> and the east <laughs> and the west in Europe and uh, America. No, and <laughs> all over, all over. Yeah. So, um, where do things go off track often? You know, where where do we get off track? And uh, w you know, what do we see? Well, probably the biggest issue with uh, 
with these is really, uh, as this slide says, is kind of a euphemism here in the United States. We say garbage in, garbage out. You know, you put garbage in the system, you're going to get garbage out of the system. And uh, so, we, you know, data quality really is one of the top issues when it comes to user adoption. So, um, you know, a lot of our integration projects work around customer management, and that's kind of the charter of Scribe. We move customer data anywhere. And so, you know, when we talk about customer-focused data, we're often talking about CRM systems that need to be adopted. And one of the big challenges is adoption, of course, and so people build, you know, integrations to help with adoption. So uh, bad data is one of those things that cause people to stop using the systems that we're trying to implement, and they'll find other ways around it uh, in order to maybe uh, you know, contact their customers. Uh, they want to look into a system to find that information, and they might find more useful information in their Outlook than they find in, you know, in CRM system or in their ERP system. So, not having that data for the for the user when needed is really one of the problems. So, bad data really is bad data. Um, so, things like uh, addressing the data quality issues before you integrate is really an important part of uh, the strategy here is to make that either part of the process that you know before we build this integration we're going to make sure that we have you know all the customers in properly uh, and this is also one of the challenges of integration is um, is kind of inherent in the, in the systems that we're working with we mentioned a very traditional um, method of a uh, ERP to CRM integration. You know, an ERP system's typical focus is around sending invoices and inventory to people to pay and consume that information, and that's usually based around a business and an address. It really doesn't have very much to do with keeping, making sure that I'm intimate with my customer and I understand their role in the organization, and so because of that, the way the data is organized in something like an ERP system is very simple. I have a, an account, I have an address, I may have some contact information. Now, if I'm in a business-to-business -business selling scenario, that relationship that I have with that customer is much more sophisticated than that. It's much more complex, right? I ha I'm sending an invoice to a company, but the buyers aren't addresses. They're not even the purchasing agent. They're typically people that come to webinars, the people that read my emails, <laughs> there are other individuals that are involved in the buying process. And so CRM systems have a much more sophisticated way of managing those, that data hierarchy of, yeah, here's the company, but here's Bill Smith. He's the purchasing agent in this department, and he works with the IT people to help them do this and that. So when Bill Smith hits my website for a you know, for to come to a webinar or download a white paper, I need to tie that into the appropriate system. It can't just go to Acme Incorporated. It has to go, you know, that specific piece of information has to go to a specific person and, you know, so I can take those specific actions. And this type of journey that so many of us on this call are on and trying to understand and get into doing better at is understanding that kind of one-to-one -one relationship that we have with individuals. And, and uh, so this is one of the challenges with dealing with this kind of garbage in, garbage out kind of problem is that these systems don't all kind of have a hierarchy like that. And often we need to have a good planning method that gets outside of the systems and much more kind of into how are we relate with our customers in the big picture. What are we doing? We also have to get down into the, let's say, the, the very specific details. So things like casing the data, you know, properly casing that data from coming out of an, a legacy ERP system where back in the day everybody, you know, hit shift lock and then everything was typed in all uppercase. But, you know, now when I'm sending out my emails and I'm getting that sourced out of my CRM system, I need to properly case the data, or I need to, you know, uh, keep capture things like my person's uh, um, professional degrees as in, in order to more personalize their experience uh, with my organization. So getting data quality in the system, the target systems is so important for us, and so you you got to fix it, and you really it involves uh, checking that data on a constant basis. Uh, 
you know, cleaning it up along the way, and then sometimes stopping the integration project and cleaning the data up, whether that's staging it out into a staging area and getting the hierarchy proper. One of the processes that I've seen, and I was working t this last week with a state agency here in the U.S. that was inv that is involved in maintaining, uh, uh, actually, believe it or not, inmate data for all of their state, um, all the inmates in one one particular state. And uh, so this team uh, is going county by county to bring each one of their, you know, they probably got 30 counties in the state. So they've developed a way to stage the data up because all these counties use different systems and now their new target application has, you know, very specific data structure. So they replicate that data structure, that data hierarchy in staging systems and then they work on migrating from their their source applications into the staging environment and then they have the hierarchy set and then all the all of the integrations are really between the staging area and um, the uh, in the target uh, applications so staging the data up might be a way to do this but you know you really do have to uh, work on cleaning this data up before you do that and it sometimes is a separate project and uh, so big important part of, of uh, this experience today. Yeah, I can see that. Now, when you start an integration project, how do you decide on an approach? Should you just use an existing method or tool because that's what you've always used? Well, uh, <laughs> I guess my, I always like to think of word pictures, so, um, so you, you hear a lot of this when I talk. Uh, so this week I'm very happy, I'm, I live in Michigan, we got like 14 inches of snow this week, and I have two cars. I have a Suburban that is kind of rusty and old and kind of <laughs> sits and it gets really awful gas mileage, but this week it has been the best car that we own. We have another car that we drive around town that gets better mileage. So. It, one size does not fit all, right? So one size is not not fit all, and so the approach really has to be driven by much more about what the technology that I um, is really the secondary part of this, right? We have to um, kind of stay um, a, a agile and let the business move forward, and the technology has to kind of help us do that. So it can't just be, hey, we made a big investment in and I'll, I'll throw out a couple names, but I am not in this conversation any, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll use Scribe even. So let's say if somebody builds Scribe, for example, and uh, they made a big investment in Scribe, and they want to do something like, um, hey, we want to show, let's say, the, the status of an order on a screen uh, inside of a CRM system. And they decide that that might be best done through an iframe. So Scribe uh, right currently doesn't have a method to do it that way. We want to replicate the data. We have another thing that's coming out that's going to be doing something like that, more event-driven processing, and we, we, we're, we have a product that we're working on that will do that. But um, So it's not always, uh, always going to use the existing tool that you have to fix the problem that you've got. So you've got to get the right approach for the right job at hand. And, uh, know that it's okay, it's okay and reasonable to expect that you might have a couple tools in your bag to do integrations. So some applications are great at doing orchestration and other ones are really great at doing, you know, kind of point-to-point -point tools. And so it's, it's important that once you understand where we're moving the data from and to, that uh, we can have different applications that work and some of them work really well together, but it's not uncommon for um, you know, customers to have BizTalk and Scribe or, you know, us, you know, kind of work, a lot of our customers have our competitive products, uh, you know, in place too. So it's not a, it's not unreasonable to do, to see that. And so you really have to uh, be able to do that. And the, the other part I would say to this is it's the, the boiling the ocean thing, that there, there's this tension that constantly happens where, you know, we can visualize and envision a lot of stuff in IT, get creative people in there and go, yeah, we can do all of this, it'd be great. And um, so we need a platform and then we're going to, you know, everything is going to be built on that, that platform and that there's an, a tension between growing into something. And uh, so they have, you know, strategies and there's some pros and cons to that. You, you'll even hear us talk about growing into some things. But you really need to consider, like, who's going to maintain all of that and what's going to happen after the fact. And um, 
one of the things that, and I've talked about this today with a very large bank uh, in Europe today, uh, of picking the right approach, and I call it the free puppy effect, right? So you get you have this tool, and it's like, uh, and I'll pick on something like a SQL. So Microsoft SQL has this great integration service thing where you can write little scripts and you can connect the data into a target application uh, by all this custom development work. And and a lot of folks like this because it's free. Well, <laughs> the cost of upgrading now this bank is basically stuck in the mud because the cost of rewriting all of that SSIS integration, uh, they want to upgrade the version of their application. So they have to basically go back to the drawing board and rewrite the whole integration that they had in SSIS. So one of the things about selecting the approach I always ask is how much is it going to cost to go to the next version of my applications? So what's that impact of going maybe, you know, the business, the IT director says, hey, we're moving to the cloud or we're going to change off platform or we're going to go to a hosting partner for these customers. It's those types of things that when you uh, select the platforms, those can be now, uh, like in Dilbert, the preventer of productivity, where IT actually is the roadblock for us moving forward with our business because we are so wedded or so connected to a platform that doesn't let us be agile. So, you know, a lot of us on the call are, we're using technology as a strategic lever in our business, and we want to stay agile and let that business move forward with new features and functions and things. And so it's that kind of thing where the, the approach or the technology has to be agile enough to manage those, those kind of pushers, if you will, or those kind of things that kind of drive us forward as a business. And that's quite frankly why... Um, a lot of the cloud is successful today because they're able to bring your own device and subvert IT by just going around them because um, the integration or the the adoption is so complicated. So let's if we can just put it on a credit card and and uh, buy it, and the manager will sign off. Organizations are starting to you know buy into subscription-based services that don't require IT to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's why that selecting the approach is so important and not getting so. Like woohoo, we made this big investment for you know ten, five years ago, and you know we've invested a million bucks. Uh, sometimes it might still be still might not be the to, best way to go, huh? Still might not be the best way to go. Exactly. Yeah. So when you're finding doing an integration, what are some of the common issues you have to be aware of when you're designing your integration jobs? Are there different things to consider for different situations? Are there common things that you have sure. to be aware of or to look out for? Sure. So earlier in the conversation, we talked about the API economy, and that's a little shorthand kind of inside baseball um, kind of conversation or phraseology that has a lot of in, uh, implications behind it. So I first want to talk about that for a sec because that really addresses this issue. So when we talk about the API economy, first the API, if we've got folks that aren't technical on the call, the API stands for an application program interface. And what the idea or the concept is, is instead of providing a very, let's say, access to the database directly, um, and let's just use Twitter as an example, right? Say, I want to work and integrate my application to Twitter. So every time we release a new product, it sends a tweet out, you know, something like that. So, um, you know, uh, Twitter has an uh, the idea you, you can you can connect directly to our database and log into your account and then put data you know, in there. So in the back end of their application is this database. Well, they don't want to do that because the database may change, the schema might modify, they will change the application over time. And so what they do is they build out what's commonly referred to as an API. And that's basically a programmable way for a developer to connect into that application using the URL of twitter.com or whatever it is, pass in a username and password, and programmatically create a tweet instead of having to go to the client to do that or the database. And so that allows them to expose their application out in a secure way and still make changes to their application over time and allow people to programmatically interface with their system. And so this this is um, how uh, so many of the modern applications are working today where uh, instead of giving you access to the database, I'm going to give you access to an application layer and you have to pass and it's primarily web-based, of course, and uh, so then we can connect into all these applications and, and that's what Scribe does with our connectors and that's what our developers do and our customers do 
with our tools is develop you know these kind of API connections and a whole economy and ecosystems then spawn up around these applications whether that's uh, SAP and they have their APIs and there's a whole set of applications that spawn up around that Microsoft has its whole ecosystem Twitter I mean all these applications that's how they work so um, that's all awesome and on paper that's great but one of the one of the, the costs of that economy is performance is that it has always been much quicker obviously to go right to the database and connect right down there down at that kind of very lowest level where the data exists as opposed to going through this other layer that needs a web connection and uh, has a, a authentication and kind of a call and response a session for me to make that transaction from my one system to another it's a slower than it, it used to be and so performance becomes a big issue right so this is uh, one of the things when we get into the design we always have to do performance kind of questions and even in an enterprise testing I just before this presentation I had a phone call with somebody saying oh we're using um, this CRM application a specific one and in testing we could set it uh, and move all this data through but in production we keep getting these errors and uh, so when we're talking and they're like and in that production environment it is actually much more horsepower in that we have servers are all like spanned across and we have load balancing and all these cool things in there and it's supposed to be much more performance and uh, talking about it it's like well in some ways yeah you have more performance but primarily not faster you have the ability now to have more people simultaneously accessing the application but the individual transaction isn't any faster than it is in your production in your testing environment you could actually even say that it's actually faster in the test because it's all on one machine uh, than it is in your production environment. So yeah, in production I can handle 50,000 concurrent users, but one transaction isn't faster in my production environment. So these are the kind of things that you need to uh, keep in mind when we're doing this performance kind of tuning. Also, when we step back and we're talking about um, you may have to do um, other things on the back end in order to stage the data up or to even still use some of the on-premise tools that are available of like having different passes and copying um, elements of like the primary keys of the data to local systems so um, I don't have to always go out and find the customer ID or the key in my web service so I'll use two examples Microsoft both Microsoft awesome online um, tool for CRM systems and there's many of them on the children of this customer unique record ID that they generate for every record in the system or modify that record we need to know what that record ID because that's what the um, define that some way so you can either make a call out to the web service there's Please give me the ID so I can tell you to update this record, or I can bring the record initially, or through many jobs we can copy those those uh, X those ID records down to a local table, and then look locally uh, for that cross reference information, and then issue an update call as opposed to a lookup and then update this record. So there's multiple passes you may need to do in order to do that. And the other idea is, as we talked about replication versus integration, you know, this is where that end user experience counts, right? So uh, uh, an excellent example is financial systems. We have customers that do financial systems all the time. And so a common method is you've got your customer record in your financial management system and in my CRM system and I want to when I got the customer on the phone I want to look in my CRM system and talk to them a little bit about their portfolio or at least understand where they're at with their current portfolio which exists today and is updated every day in the financial systems so the thing when you think about it CRM has to we can um, we can either replicate those millions of records every night or we can provide the user with a uh, uh, an experience where they just to the user it seems like the data is local but in fact it's just pulling it on the fly through a web service call so the data is integrated but it's not replicated so in those scenarios we have customers doing both where they're they're integrating the customer record 
but that individual daily portfolio comes through an iframe down to that user. So, um, so you can design the systems for that end user and that's what it's all about really is synchronizing data so that that end user is able to perform their, you know, their interaction with the customer in a timely way. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about the people component of a project. How important is it to continue including your customer or your stakeholder in the project? So, how do you, um, um, how do you avoid issues that can arise from assumptions or, or miscommunications? Well, excellent question. So the thing is, uh, inside of any good, um, you know, if we, we looked at organizations that are enterprise kind of customers that have uh, a very formal IT process, they call it UAT, User Acceptance Testing. And this is a constant part of the project. If I go back to our first little part of the conversation when we were talking about that salesperson putting their order in or doing a quote, it's involving those same folks in that process and it's a constant part of a project so that we're um, getting that feedback to make sure that you know we're addressing their needs and often those organizations also have pilot teams and even in the smallest customers that I've had uh, from you know when we're doing a Salesforce automation and it's you know five user department and I'm picking a pilot team that is got subject matter experts uh, from each one of those areas that are going to be affected by this change and they're giving me that feedback are we hitting the mark or are we missing the mark and they also become liaisons then um, to their teams behind the scenes and so they sit in their team meetings and go hey I was at the testing session last week or the training session and this is what it looked like and this is what we're doing so it helps uh, to have clear communications of what can and cannot happen and um, you know, if something comes up in the middle and they say, hey, you really missed the ball on this, we need this one thing, uh, resetting expectations uh, with that. And, uh, you know, um, people that are in the partner community, you know, the IT professionals uh, often have what we refer to as statements of work, you know, so we're going to get paid to do X amount of work for this. And so you think about it like that, it's like you're setting expectations often through uh, not only something written, but also something that's communicated over time. And it really obviously helps to take things in small chunks, check in all the time, stick to the choices that you made early on. And like we said earlier on, don't, you know, we're not boiling the ocean, as they say. You know, we can't fix every problem in this one. And so it's a it's a path, it's a journey in this sprint cycle where so that's how that's how we're doing. Okay. So we've talked mostly about the project planning and other considerations for implementing integration. What are some of the ways we can keep your customer and key stakeholders involved for a successful project for them? Yeah, so, you know, again, it's uh, including our customers every step of the way. Uh, again, uh, that user acceptance testing is it's really an important part of the process. Uh, so having that set up in a lab or something on that order, integrations, of course, can be scary. Uh, the one thing that, you know, we're really dealing not just with the data as we talked about earlier that we're dealing with the business process. So, you know, the thing is, it's really change management uh, also in that we are not just um, moving data, but we're affecting people's jobs often and things like this. So people kind of like their jobs and they like to hold on to those things. And uh, so uh, it is important to involve people in that, those kind of softer skills too. Um, and the other thing I think that's always really important is it's the um, it's it's the journey, right? It's the what's next uh, question. What is the next thing that we're going to do as part of this process? We are on a long journey. We're going to get order. You know, we're going to get that quote uh, integration done. But first, we're doing the products, and then what's the next thing that we have to do? So it's getting that that those folks back involved in the process again to understand that uh, hey, we need that feedback. We need to learn what we did well and, and what we didn't and let's keep moving and so having those kind of frequent check-ins and uh, acceptance testing is really really key to uh, you know successful project great well I think we're going to take one more survey before we wrap things up here yeah so we're going to go ahead and uh, just ask you guys we're going to go ahead and launch uh, another survey of the last five topics uh, we discussed which ones would you like to see We need to have music here. 
Yeah. Need to have Jeopardy the, music or something. The Jeopardy music. Yeah. <laughs> Doo -doo. Definitely. <laughs> and we're getting a lot of good responses again this time. This is great. So please do go ahead and indicate which topics are most of interest to you. Go ahead and give it another second here. All right, we'll go ahead and close that. And there actually is uh, one more poll question we'd like to ask you. Uh, just really quick, has today's webinar met your expectations? Is this what you were expecting? Uh, or, or let us know what you feel. Great, just another second here. Looks like most of you are voting. Great, good to know. All right. All right, great. So it looks like uh, we, we do have a few questions in here. Um, but before we go over those, I'd just like to uh, reiterate, uh, beginning the week of February 17th, we will be offering uh, more of a deep dive into the topics that we have discussed today. So keep an eye out for emails from us. We'll certainly be uh, letting you guys know when these webinars will come on and uh, we'll be getting deeper into the topics that you told us that you wanted to hear about today. And uh, we'll just go over a few questions. Uh, one of the questions I, Pierre had already answered, he did define what an API uh, was. Uh, another question uh, for Pierre, I would assume, uh, this is someone would like to hear more about using Scribe as a scheduler to drive CRM events. So um, there's there's a, a couple things uh, that that could mean. Uh, so uh, you know, Scribe has what we refer to as a publisher, and we're able to pull data out of a dynamic CRM during the on save event. So when somebody saves or deletes or updates a record, Scribe receives a, a notification of that through an XML file to say here's the record, and so from there we have processes that can listen to that. Uh, Paul, though, you may want to talk a little bit about our event-driven processing thing that we're... we're or yeah, that you mentioned that a little bit earlier, and uh, so this is something that we're going to be introducing with our Scribe Online platform here shortly, and it's really the capability to drive, uh, to drive the integration platform externally. The way it works today is everything's based off a of query, so you set up a map that queries a source, gets back some records, and does some operations, and it gets a target or multiple targets. With this event-based processing that we're introducing, you'll have a REST API that you can call externally. You can pass in some information that will get fed down to a specific map, run against uh, one or more targets, build up a response that will then be sent back to the uh, requester. So, you know, one of the things that you talked about earlier, Pierre, was this idea of bringing data in real time into an iframe. And uh, so there may be cases where you don't necessarily want to synchronize all of your data in two places, make two complete copies, but you really just want to be able to pull some piece of information from one system into the UI of another system yeah. like CRM. And that, that's actually a great use case for this yeah. event-based processing that we're going to be introducing here shortly. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And uh, it looks like the last question here, uh, we talked a little bit about multi-target, but is it possible to have multi-source? multiple sources. Um, so in, uh, Paul, you may have some, something to add to this, uh, because in our, our, current, um, our current method uh, that Scribe has, we do not have a multiple source system where you're able to, uh, uh, you know, from a use case standpoint, it's looking at a specific object or a specific query. So sometimes the query could involve multiple sources driving an event, uh, but but uh, st structurally that still is looked at as one one um, source. Yeah. So when we talk about multi-target, you're still able to do lookups and things against those targets as well. So it is possible to yeah. bring data in from multiple places um, when you've yep. done the query against the one system. Yep. Exactly. All right. Well, as Scott said, we're, I think we're at the top of the hour now. So we'll thank you all for your time. This has been great, and yeah. we look forward to seeing you on the deep dive. Yes, and for anybody that didn't have their questions answered, we'll be responding to you uh, by email shortly. Thanks, everyone.